to go to Michael Gill, who's here to talk about Snowflake. Okay, so I want to start with you know an invitation that this presentation is very very casual. Uh, kind of kind of threw this together, and feel free to interrupt me at any point, ask questions. You know, if we want to dive, dive deep on any part that maybe I'm just gonna just gonna gloss over here. We can give it a, can give it a shot. Uh, you know, very very chill night. So in terms of, in terms of background, uh, so I was introdu introduced to Snake when I was working at Petco last year. Um, so yeah, for most of the year, year I was working on a, a data warehouse creation project. So we were working on migrating from, from an on-prem, old, old school data warehouse, uh, IBM, IBM Netiza, which was at end of life, like no longer supported by IBM. So we, we, we migrated to Snowflake. So I had the opportunity to be a Snowflake customer, a uh, big fan of the product, which I feel like is not something you, all, you always say about your, you know, your, SaaS, your SaaS product software tooling, but I think Snowflake is, is really solid uh, and the paper was, was pretty approachable, so just decided to, to give it a shot. All right, so today uh, I'm gonna start by, go, by going over some kind of database, database data warehouse history. Uh, talk about how Snowflake, the company, comes into the picture. Uh, talk about what was actually present, actually presented in the paper, and then, and then wrap it up with kind of what how the landscape has just changed since I think this was a 2014 or 2015 paper. So in the last few years since then. Cool. Uh, uh, lots of to some some this guy Frank he wrote a LinkedIn post or a LinkedIn. I don't know what they're called. They're called uh, the data, where data warehousing evolution. So I took some pictures from him, and I thought it was a really, really solid overview. <coughs> cool. So he had uh, this image. So he's saying it went from uh, RDBMS to, to the specialized warehousing appliance, appliances to Hadoop, Hadoop. Uh, and then kind of the cloud got introduced. So there's some data warehouses built on top of the cloud. And then it's Snowflake, Snowflake data warehouse. This, he's a Snowflake consultant, so that's why he <laughs> put Snowflake as oh, no, oh my gosh, it's this game game changing technology that you need to implement if you're in the cloud. So, but it is, it's very good, very good technology. Cool. So RDBMS, I was actually kind of surprised. Uh, so relational data, which I think is very is very core to basically all computing. Not all computing, but a lot of computing today is built on, on this idea of relational data. Data uh, people are thinking in SQL when they think data. So this idea of relational data only came, came up uh, in 1970. So I think relative, relatively late in the game, in my opinion. Uh, by E. F. Odd, I guess he wrote a paper. Paper. So if anyone's interested in pre pre presenting that, we check it out. Um, and then the first co commercial systems are available. From 1979, so that was the first system available to the masses. It had SQL at that point, so from very very early on, SQL was the de facto de relational based uh, language. That was Oracle that launched the first system. Um, so you know they became Oracle. It was kind of built. built. MS was huge, right? And then they became a huge company based on this you know, you know, this new system. Thing. Uh, the you know SQL systems that we think of today kind of came out uh, in the 90s. Part so SQL, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, all came out in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and RDB, RDBMS were built mostly for these ideas of transaction processing. Um, you know, so we think of okay, of, okay, you insert a row in the database, you know, you update. A row in the database, or you select, select, you know, maybe a few rows from the database. Built on this idea of you know, small transactions working on, you know, most of the time, time rows of data. Um, but, um, but people were using these database databases, and obviously wanted to write more complex queries than this. So kind of the first analytical warehousing tech, tech, tech technologies just were these databases that you were also using as your transaction system. Um, but because they weren't they weren't really designed analytics, you eventually started to hit issues with the scaling. Let me see. 
All right. So then, so then in data warehousing, you often hear, often hear um, OLTP systems or OLAP systems, so different databases. So OLTP is online, online transaction processing. Uh, and that's you know, this idea that kind of you're working in a row system. Uh, so if you want to select, you know, select first name from, from customers, most of these database, these database systems to retrieve the entire row because chances are that like if you want first name, you probably also want the last name, you're gonna kind of get all the information from your user a lot of time presented on the screen. Um, OLAP systems, on the other hand, so online analy analytics processing cases, tend to, be, tend to be thinking in terms of columns. So rather than, you know, selecting frame or last, you know, you know, think better if you think of like an order, for example, rather than selecting one, one order, most of the time you're going to do some do something like some order amount amount across all of the orders in your database. So it's at that point it's inefficient to say okay I'm going to I'm going to pull the full row for every order order that means like date status you know customer you don't care about all that other data yeah? so you want a system that's just op optimized to you know just look at the the totals that you're summing and, and do some operation on them yeah so OLAP to be optimized for aggregating large data sets. Uh, OLTP is optimized for inserts, upda updates, deletes, doing those things, those things efficiently. Turn OLL acronym or initialism for key value stores? No, I don't think, so yeah, in this presentation, I don't really talk at all, at all about key value stores. Um, um, it definitely has a place in in this world, obviously, obviously, as like a data, I think gener generally key values were like very, 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 very hot for a kid, and then people went back to they re realized that like managing these schemaless systems was pretty hard, and like and like it's very if you're trying to do analytics. They're, they're kind of they're like an under underlying substrate. We build this stuff on top on top of that, which is for example for example TV, which I mentioned is a key value store. Um, we build both row based, based and column based key value stores. Or you could just use the key value. I think, yeah, when we think of, they definitely have a place, uh, not, not gonna really talk about the air, but sure. as Gus, you can definitely bring it in. And then there are architectures that do both, right? That's OLTP and OLAP in a similar way. Yeah, OLTP and OLAP are similar systems. Do you have an example of a? There are some, some. Um, so the easiest example, example is MySQL, um, that it has a column store for Back end that you can use in, in the same engine uh, at, the, uh, at the same Okay. It's not very good, but technically it is called. There's also yeah. a IDB matrix, which is a Facebook internal that's got open source, but now there's a company. They do key value column and micro base basically with their domain, all of it. And it gives you this like schema list power hour with all of it. Pick and choose. The general category, category, and typically the, the, the boundaries are kind of fuzzy generally. Yeah, yeah. But it's typically one is used for used for operational loads. I'm 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 clear small numbers of records to you know take orders and stuff like that. Analytics is like, hey, let's look at look at zillions of orders or, or records all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's probably too good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Do they have a white paper? Yeah, they do. That might be an interesting. Wow, one. sounds like a great future presentation. <laughs> and as you'll as you'll learn from this, you don't have a lot of time at the beginning. <laughs> <of the day. laughs> so definitely sign up for a future month. Do you want to be a co-organizer? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe depending on depending on our new location. Oh, awesome. uh, all right. So to solve some of the problems, right? So you have you have these mostly MP type system systems. And we, you start to hit issues with scale. Uh, so, so at this point, that specialized data warehousing, warehousing appliances started to come started to come into there. Things like Teradata, which is here in San Diego. Woo, San Diego. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these uh, Vertica, Vertica. So these companies slash systems that you know. Okay, we sell this specialized database, specialized server server that we're going to you know install it into it into your center. And you know it's going to support large vol volumes of data, really big queries. Like we're going to do do what you, do what you want. Um, 
And yeah, so a lot of these, they, they use these MEP architectures, they're called. So it's just the idea, the idea that, you know, you have many different nodes that all have a subset of the data and are going to be able to process in isolation and then combine, you know, you know what to do to run more efficiently. Um, and the issue with these data warehouses are they're, they're very, very ex expensive. So really only larger enterprises can use them. And you look there, yeah. Okay, no, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, only prizes. But at, at this point, when these companies are coming up, only large enterprises really have a volume, volume of data where they need to use them. Use them. Um, and the other issue that tends to come up is because there's no elasticity in your system, system you kind of have you have to buy you have to buy a system big enough to handle your highest volume period. For a lot of companies, that, that tended to be Monday mornings when, when business users come to work and they have to get ready for their, their meetings. So they start running all of these reports on top of your data warehouse. warehouse. This thing just like grinds to a halt when people need it the most. Um, in addition to this, it kind of, of introduced a lot of, the, a lot of the bad thing that needs to happen in data warehousing because you don't want to be loading new, new data in during the day when, day when people are trying to get data out because that's going to you know, fight for, for resources. So basically, every, everyone is running jobs overnight, night, to get into the data warehouse, and then yeah, you come in in the morning and spray it out. Did we have a question? No, 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 no. I was just, I was just, I was okay, doing this. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll just keep my hands out of your side. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> now I know. I think evil bots are not against in the code of comments, so <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so then, again, from this guy's great post online, uh, you know, in the two, 2000s, data uh, really to scale up. So previously, right, it was only these large enterprises that uh, that, um, that needed these data these data warehouses were the only ones with huge volumes of data. And all, all of a sudden, you know, we're producing more data, more data right and left, more users on the internet, on the internet, more devices. You know, we got logs right and left. Tons of data. The internet is exploding. Uh, um, so data starts growing, and other companies, even like small startups now, are, are hitting these issues where they have more data, data than they know what to do with. Luckily, period in the early 2000s, there's a, a company that comes in to save the day that has been dealing with, dealing with large volume data for a long, time, a long time, and and that company is Google. So Google releases a couple of, of like really huge paper uh, in the early 2000s that are basically like, hey guys, guys, we've been using big data for a long, long time now, and this is how we do it. How we do it. Uh, or in some cases, this is how, how we used to do it. We already don't do it this way anymore, but we'll let you catch up. <laughs> so in 2003, uh, they have the Google file system paper that comes out. I'm not going to go over this, but another great one to present if you're, in you're interested. Uh, and, uh, and in 2000, they released the MapReduce paper. Which is like, like really huge. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, people are like, "Wow, reduce this great parent to process big data. We should all start doing that." Matt. Were they really not doing doing that before then? Was Google not? Google not? No, like like not doing any like like it, it just seemed like such a. a I remember, I remember hearing about that. And I was about like, <coughs> what you do, you do would do data. It wasn't, it be? wasn't, it wasn't under the test yet. Yeah. So my understanding is right. Like the idea of like distrib distributed system, distributed data processing existed before MapReduce. Yeah. For sure. But it was like this idea that like we have we have this you know standardized way to run big data processing jobs of like first you map and then you and you reduce and like so software engineers operate within that system, okay. right? So like you as a company can provide this fleet. fleet can run MapReduce jobs, jobs, and then people can submit jobs to this cluster, and like that is like, yeah, you just think of and reduce, and like, and like you as the software engineer only need to know that, and like, like me as a systems person just deploy the system. I think that wasn't out there yet. Out there yet. And I, I, I was a sysadmin, or becoming a sysadmin, right around that time, and kind of the paradigm I was used to was like. Had network attached, attached storage like NAS, like and that was where all the storage were was, and then you had your compute, which was somewhere else, right? 
And the idea of like bringing the compute and the, and the storage was like kind of alien to the world that I kind of started to get to know. Yeah, the, yeah, these like commodity chains. I guess that I guess that was another big one. like this idea that like yeah, a box can die, and in MapReduce, totally okay, okay. Well, you're gonna give up to someone else. So I guess everyone writing their own custom stuff for their their own. Right. Right. Yeah. But yeah, so map so MapReduce was a game changer before yeah, people were like, yeah. yeah. And they did. Um, so Hadoop comes out, and it has Hadoop file system based on the Google file system system as Hadoop MapReduce, which is MapReduce. Um, and this and this was, you know, really I would say like the, like the big data solution. Everyone is doing big data on Hadoop. It's like the greatest greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, uh, people are very into it. Uh, but in terms of you know how Hadoop, that ecosystem system fits in what was currently out there in like the data warehousing world. Uh, so Hadoop was a totally new model, right? So in early Hadoop, early MapReduce world, you know, you were writing map and reduce jobs. So you needed to be a software engineer with those skills to write that, write that kind of job. It wasn't, you know, this nice SQL-based system that you had known now for, for I guess, 20 years. You're a large enterprise, and for the last 20 years, you've been running these jobs on your data warehouse. And now people are like, oh, you have to use Hadoop. Hadoop. You have people that you need to retrain to understand this new system. Um, in addition to that, you, know, you have reporting thing and stuff that again affects the SQL. And SQL and it's, at the time, that didn't exist for Hadoop world. It does more now, more now, but time that was like that was like didn't play nicely with each other. Um, so, so what you saw was that Hadoop, it did come into the data, warehouse, data warehousing world, and basically what you would have is you would still have your data warehouse, but now it started to introduce new data sets. You would you know, put, them, put them into your Hadoop there, run some sort of processing to transform you know, these log files, these big JSON objects, into, into a relational, and then you would shove that into your data warehouse, and then you, know, you could go on happy. So Hadoop apparently had a play, had a play. Uh, it was a big complement to the data warehouse, but it was a separate thing. And as people started started to, you know, dive into Hadoop, it was it was like a thing to get into. All right. So then, then after this, you know, Hadoop world, it's great, it's great. Everyone can do the systems. In, in 2006, AWS comes into the picture. They launch with like, S S3, US, and EC2. EC2. Um, and you know now now the new hot thing is oh we got to go to the cloud, Every, everyone's in the cloud. Um, at at first there wasn't like any data warehouse for the cloud, right? right? So you still had you're one of these one of these companies that had a data warehouse. You had your, your data warehouse on prem, and then you know maybe you were starting to push things into the cloud, new development up there. Um, but then a few later, you started to come. So BigQuery I guess actually predates. Redshift. Um, at a time where BigQuery, BigQuery launched is very different from BigQuery today. But the BigQuery on the Google Cloud Cloud platform comes out in 10. And uh, Redshift launches in 2012. So now you have your data warehouse in the cloud. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And then and then even at the end of people starting to move to the cloud really appreciate what it gives to you. Uh, uh, this idea for uh, for the Flake data warehouse. So Snowflake launches to some customers in 2014 and is likely available in 2015. Cool. So Snowflake, the company. Um, um, so currently, Snowflake most re most recently raised. Oh no, I guess over its life has raised like 920 million dollars. It's like a pretty big start. Uh, uh, their valuation is four billion dollars right now. Fair. So they started off, I think, in the paper. They are only on AWS, US, where you could run Snowflake. Snowflake. Today, you can run it on any of the major public cloud clouds, Google, Azure, and AWS. US. Yeah. All right. Then we get to the paper. So what was, what was first questions about uh, are there no. any equivalents of Snowflake uh, around that time? Around the time that 
I mean, I would say it would most directly be compared with Redshift, right? When launched. They. Well, I think in the paper too, they even mentioned like Azure's data warehouse. I think that's like a like a clear third though. I I bet anyone that talked about Azure's data warehouse. So I don't know. There's a lot, a lot of really good art. Um, you're talking about Monet DB being probably the biggest inspiration. Exasol, Vertica. Uh, there's lots of lots of other other uh, products that, that predated this that had different limitations. Well, yeah, and I guess all the vendors that were like still data warehouses, you know, they're like you know Teradata is still doing fine up up in Rancho Bernardo Bernardo also. So. Like, they they are ultra innovating with their product as much as they can. I, I hear they're <laughs> <in> trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I made a, I, I just picked, made a lot of inferences from as much as much as they can. I don't know. They, they did specific, specifically specifically okay. Monet to be the uh, later flavor of it and might be what we're talking about later. Um, really, really, really. Don't know anything about that, but we can we can you can. <laughs> I look forward to it. All right. So in the paper. All right, so the paper starts out, starts out with this introduction. Uh, they start off by saying the cloud is really cool. We all love the cloud. We, you know, we love the fact that we have, we have these economies. That, that, that <laughs> Compute is really cheap now. Um, things very elastic. Stick, you know, if I need new servers, servers very quick. Spin those up. We love the cloud. Uh, they're saying that data warehouses houses don't fit. Um, um, so like legacy data warehouses aren't being uh, the cloud model. So right, so right, they are elastic. You know, they're very. You bought it, you're stuck with it until you do a big upgrade, which is not fun. Um, as you talked about about in the new part, a lot of the data data now that they're starting to process can't really be processed in your data warehouse. So things the so things that are like these files, JSON, XML objects. For the most part, your your data warehousing technology does not not handle that very well, um, right? And then we have this issue where the big data platform, so the Hadoop's, and now I guess, I guess Spark is around by now. Now they don't really fit in with the data warehousing model too great. So Snowflake comes in and they're like, "Can we can we build a data warehouse from house from the ground up, designed for the cloud?" They do. Uh, so then they go over the, the key features of features of Snowflake, and I think like think like so obviously this paper in addition to like talk, talking about the innovation is they're also trying to sell Snowflake. Uh, um, a lot of these are kind of call outs to the other systems at that point. Uh, so uh, so first they talk about software as a service service, very contrary to most of the other systems at this point. You know like. Red, for example, is, is like it has a lot of fire, but there's a lot of tune, a lot of tune. It doesn't just work out of the box as much as Snowflake attempts to. Um, so we're like a real, real relational data with SQL and transactions. So this was like a call out of Google Cloud Platform at the time. I'm in BigQuery, like BigQuery at this point doesn't support you know, up, you know updates. You just append data and then you can query it really fast because the product product kind of came out of. How do, how do I process really fast? I think is the idea, or just like Google click stream data really fast. Um, yeah. So yeah. So then they have the structured data support. So they support JSON and XML. This is all out of yeah, yeah. We can go after the world where people where people have to do this processing outside. Now you can get in your data warehouse. It's elastic. I think this is like the real innovative thing at this point. So they completely separate their storage and their compute. At this point, again, Redshift shift is like barely coupled. Redshift cluster has got a certain amount of hard drive space. It's got a certain certain number of nodes. You know, certain CPU CPU setup. You kind of lock into that. Uh, then they just kind of like go like go over some like stuff. stuff. Acid transactions. Acid is like. Um, is it, yeah. Consistent, isolated, and bold. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> Basically, means they're like good, good consistent. Well, yeah, that's that's one of the words. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the piece that you want your database yeah, to have oh, generally. Consistent, what were the other? Isolated, isolated and durable. Durable. Okay. 
D for Venture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, yeah. They're right. basically good, tra good <laughs> transactions. Yeah, they, pretty much all of the RDBMS industry is, is, is dancing on that. That is a may hold with the kind of core guarantee. There are some exceptions. But I mean, that, that, does that mean they're serializable transactions? I can never keep track, track of this. Not necessarily. Not probably, necessarily. necessarily a whole other, that's probably a whole other time. The way I've always parsed out is that if I open a transaction, I'm in my own mind on the line. Mm -hmm. You do a bunch of stuff in there. You fail, it rolls back like the rest of the system. I'm not impacted. If I commit it, I, I guarantee I'm going to commit based on my role. Okay. Like you, oh, the idea is you can take all these parallel transactions and then check check out what they did. They did, and in principle, you can imagine imagine them having them applied in or in some order serially, mm -hmm. and you'll get the same same result in your data. But that's basically that's basically the concept. Unless you just meant really specifically what happens. Yeah. I just wasn't familiar with the acronym. Okay. Yep. Big acronym. Yeah, it's a thing people say. It will come up. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, so yeah, then, yeah, then they go over their snowflake architecture. So there are three layers. You have you have your your storage layer, the data processing layer, and then there are cloud services layer that's kind of orchestrating the whole thing. Uh, yep. So I would say I would say the the C cost uh, of Snowflake is this is the logo for S3. Uh, uh, so right, it is launched. He's not happy with that logo. It's not. It should shouldn't be the bucket. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not intending for you to my reaction. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's, it's so a computer bright. screen. I'm imagining. You know. <laughs> um. Yeah. So US S3 3 is kind of uh, the core thing that goes on. Basically, Snowflake has custom custom file format that they are using as the storage engine of their database. So they're just writing. You know, big, big S3 objects, uh, uh, and these objects have some metadata at the top that are like, hey, in, in you know, from this byte, this byte, byte, in this column, of, or you know, it's part of this column of data. From here to here, it's this. And S3 does support for it, so you can, uh, uh, well, so you can read the specific parts of the file. So they don't have to scan the whole file. They don't have to grab the whole file. File read just the parts. The parts that they know data. That they need. To do, you, do you know what the latency is to access S3? Like to do a read three? Um, great. Yeah. yeah but, so right, a data warehouse is never like. Yeah. That shouldn't be the, the expensive part. It's part. <laughs> it's like it's it's like on the order of one two milliseconds if you're if you're got the your locality right. S3. Okay. And and they're speculating here because I'm not familiar with that part of the paper, but they're probably not doing this for individual record cards. This is this is a, colum a columnar, columnar store. So oh yeah. yeah, if you're doing a scan or something, sure. But then you know they might like, do it. So yeah, yeah. 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 Um, right. Yeah, it is columnar. So you know, so that also lends, lends itself. They can do fancy compression, compression, things like that. Really get as much data as possible into these S3 objects. Yeah. Um, in addition to, to that, the fact that they're built on top of, S, top of S3 basically gives them all the great guarantees that S3 provides out of the box. So, so it's, your data is going to be super duper duper available and super duper durable. I forget how many nines it is for each of them. S3 has these like, they love to talk how many nines. Nines, like nines of one of them and like, I don't know. It's very big good. Pixel and all but in. in it's measurable that it's a real line. Did they, real line. Did they mention like what their what their blob size is that they're storing in S3? I don't think think they specific about that about that. No. And it's probably like it's it's not a couple K. It's it's not it's probably not more than 10, 10 megs. It's more than twenty, right? right? I would think it's big. Mm, ten, yeah, you're right. It's probably something between. Yeah, and like each blob blob represents fragments of of one in a, in a particular sequence. I think in WAB they have mul multiple calls, is my yeah. understanding. Yeah. But yeah, not totally. I mean, they don't like you know fully reveal reveal themselves. <laughs> so, so yeah, not sure. Um, so another other cool thing, uh, you know, storing your data your data in S three. Well, one storage one storage is also cheap. S three is pretty cheap. 
so you know you're not paying a lot for just the storage part. Um, and then your and then your data in S is also immutable. Immutable. So they use that to build out some of the cool features that are in Snowflake. Uh, uh, namely, there's time, tra time travel. Time travel. So you could query the database at a certain point in time. You know, give me the data data before this query was run. Run or give me that at this timestamp. Uh, and it also supports cloning. You could you could say make a copy of the table, make make a copy of this case, and those operations are instant because you're just looking at this mutable data and you're basically just you know putting pointers to it. Are any logs still immutable? Immutable? Yeah. So do they follow the same thing like the CSS where you have multiple copies? Is everything everything in single location or split across locations? Like like your font. So when you when you say a location, what are you referring? I mean, uh, a data. Stream. So S three, right? Be, right? Because S three availability and durability guarantees they're they're splitting the data data in multiple locations. But like you don't think you don't think about it as a user of S three. You're just put, putting the file and tr trusting that eight of you won't lose it. Then the column, like like your like your example, mm -hmm. so would it be split to first uh, hundred uh, or ten million rows here and here? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it's split multiple files here. for sure. Yeah. So S, mm, no, you have really huge files in S and S three. Yeah. You can't you can't put them all at once. Multi part upload. Yeah. Do do they mention like what? Anything about the actual format they put the store, store the data in file? Like, is it just sort of like, sort of like, that, like the log structure store that on S3 or something? Do they, do they mention any size they have files? Files. Like, the structure of what? No, they don't really go in detail, I think. Okay. On that. You indicate that it's, it's columnar. Right. And they're doing, they're doing, they are from columns, you know, like, based on the data types and things like that. Okay, so you could imagine, if you were to just get to it, you might imagine that engine that inside the file, inside some file in S3, they've got a bunch of keys and the column values for that column are sorted by key, by key. And there's maybe some little index at the beginning of the file or something that tells them about yeah, that. Yeah, they do, they, they do mention that. They mention that. And yeah. they've, got, they've got a bunch of those. And they're storing they're storing they have metadata okay. data in terms of like, okay, within you know, this file, well, this is the max, I mean, of this of this column, for example, you can yeah. do faster scan. Like, and as, as you do writes, they somehow how put those writes new files in S and S three. So if you're okay. doing a write, a write, they're just making a file and then you know discarding yeah. the old file based on like your time travel preferences. So how long you want to go back? Okay. So like this immutability also is like so Redshift data blocks are also immutable. Um, it's it's not on S three. But yeah, and right, like if you update a single row, they're gonna you know look at that block. It was a one megabyte gigabyte block. They're gonna mark that one as dead, one as dead, and make a new your update. So that's why, like, pretty much, pretty much all data warehouses, you want to do these these you know big. Ups. You never want to be in be in individual rows. I imagine that it's probably um, we talked about later. I imagine it's probably rather rather similar to the rest of the merge trees. Uh, trees uh, actually yeah, I imagine. Yeah. <coughs> All right, so then move up a layer there. Uh, Snowflake has these virtual warehouses. Um, so the way that it works is, you know, these are, these are just thin abstract abstractions on you know, some EC2, EC2 compute that you're spinning up. So, you know, you have your storage layer that's just S3, and then you have this warehouse. So you run a, your warehouse is going to pull the files that it needs, or the pieces of the files that it needs, that needs the object. Store it, low, store it locally, and then do compute on top of that. Um, the warehouses, they're kind of they're set up by t-shirt t-shirt sizes. You can have an extra small small warehouse warehouse up to an I don't know I think there's like some with a few X's on them, um, and that just you know very you know, very I mean you don't actually see it, but it just maps to the number of EC2 machines and probably probably the type of machine also. Um, so yeah, these virtual warehouses it. Snowflake like makes it very easy to start a warehouse, to sell a warehouse, as well as if you need to scale, to scale up a warehouse, you can do that. Um, what's, what's really cool about having these, having these virtual warehouses that, that aren't sharing any storage is that it makes it very easy to isolate processes. So in a big, enter big enterprise, for example, 
you know, a lot of, right, so if you have this big data warehouse that is just shared by the entire enter enterprise, someone can run, run this like really, really gnarly, gnarly query. Probably not one person, hopefully you didn't set up that way, but like, in theory, if people could run bad query, queries, and then all the data warehouse just, warehouse just stops one. You have to like hunt down who this bad actor was and like kill their query, and they're very with you, and the whole thing. So it's really cool that you could, you know, cleanly split out, out you know, the data warehouse for the for the finance team. This is for the marketing marketing team. This is the data warehouse we're going to use for loading new data into no play. And all these, you know, exist. It also makes it very easy, again, in this big enterprise, to see who is driving the cost for your compute. Hey, finance team, your warehouse, your warehouse is very, very good. And they're like, it's cool. We're the finance team. <laughs> We're paying the bills. So these virtual assets, you said they, 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 they live on top of the file structure. Are the, is the stuff already in this format? And then the virtual virtual warehouses are going in it? Or the virtual, where, virtual warehouses always live up, they load their data into the format and that's created? What type like, of are data? they pulling pulling all of the data? Question, or? <laughs> like, do I have to initialize my data into um, play? No, or some kind of inge ingestion. But that's happening separate from the virtual yeah. warehouse. Yeah, so exactly. the way Snowflake works, good question, is so, so for the most part, you have a copy command. It's called, it's called, so you, you have your data, you put it in S3. Yeah, just like Redshift, right? Yeah. Just like Redshift, yeah, yeah, I copy into my house. Yeah. And, then, and then, like, how the data actually sits in S3 in, in Snowflake compatible mode, you, ne you never see that. There's no way for you to wait for you to like yeah, I actually go get the file. I was kind of thinking about the workflow of all, all these virtual warehouses across the company. I mean, are they all they're all accessing accessing data that was ingested at some via some other mechanism besides their virtual Right, right. So yeah, so within Snow Snowflake, right, Sweet SQL, depending on what you're using. So if you're like in the web interface, you could, you know, select your warehouse house from the drop down. Yeah. And then you're like you're like within the so that warehouse house. Warehouse has like a local cache, for example. So if you're querying in the same table frequently, sure. maybe that data is in your cache. Um, or if you're, you know, just operating in like a pure SQL world, you just run the command use database database, database name or no, use or no, use warehouse. Okay. I don't know if that answers the question. I think so. I think I've got an idea that the, the warehouse houses are really about you and some cache. Right. All Purely about cache. Yeah. yeah. So, you say there's easy, easy scale up of them, but like, is is there like easy auto scaling and scale to zero? So there is also auto scale. So yeah. So Snowflake, it it has this idea of t-shirt sizing, sizing your part, but then it also can have auto scaling. So like your Excel plus cluster, spin up a second second Excel cluster. You know they work together. So there's both both of those. Uh, but can your can your Excel scale to medium? I don't think that is in auto scale. So in that situation, you can write, you would probably put a medium and, and turn on auto scale, and it'll, you know, it'll you know, put more medium into the picture. Oh, I see, okay. But yeah, but that, that is also support, supported. Um, something, something that like says, and I don't fully buy, is so they love to make this claim of, so right, right say you're running a query on an extra small, small, and it's four hours, hours oh, well, you can scale up to a medium, which costs, <coughs> I think it probably costs four times, probably like, probably like factors, of maybe it's eight times as much, or I don't know. It costs X amount more per hour, but they're, but they're like, oh, but it'll be times faster, because now it's a bigger, so it's like, it just finishes faster, but it's the same price. I don't think it's true. true. <laughs> Very small linear scale, scale. <laughs> as an engineer, you're like, nothing ever scales that way. Well, because if it did scale that way, way, then you would just always use the biggest, biggest cluster. Well, like, except, except if you are turning off your cluster at times, right? Like, there'd be very little, little reason to use cluster. Did they actually conceptualize it out? Or I would have assumed that it's, that it's just a, an, an upper bound on how many current processes you're willing to run, run for your query like that. Um, Do they look at it as like you're running this many nodes? And yeah. Huh. I think I think they might even how many nodes it is, it, but like, yeah, yeah, it's definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm glad yeah. this is not dedicated. Hmm? This is not dedicated to whoever is asking for something. It's shared. Yeah. So. It's a. In terms, in terms of 
So in terms of the same price, that's possible. I'm not sure I understand. So my. it's it's like like any provider, right? Mm -hmm. It's not data you. Yeah. It is that it is infrastructure <coughs> is shared across multiple and that gives gives you the economy. My guess is that it's that it's probably a gimmick that they probably have a unified cloud so that they do uh, horizontal scaling themselves and everybody, everybody's jobs done. And they just they just call it like oh you're in a large size and they, that's like it, it's probably just like a bound of like how hard are we going to execute your query your query right now? Uh, that I'm speculating. I, yeah, I'm also not sure. I think think that it is dedicated <laughs> cluster. And they I mean but like obviously they have you know like they have clusters that are on the standby as you ask for more more or less. Uh, it is a shared thing. shared thing. But. So. Yeah, that brought up a, uh, something I concept I might have conceptualized entirely wrong. I thought that Snowflake was something was something you like kind of downloaded and spit it up on your own servers, but uh, this sounds like it's totally as a serv service. Yeah, at least software as a serv service. Okay. Yeah. But there is a path, there is a path of these um, these kind of hosted offerings of software where the unit that you're buying as a as a, as a SaaS firm are very similar. I think it does map very cleanly. I forget exactly how upfront Snowflake is about it, but I think, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. All right. So then the thing we talk about is, uh, is uh, you know, because it's software as a service, they want it to be easy to use. Snowflake offers a, a web UI. Um, um, any of the numbers are pointing to. I googled it. <laughs> you have your your, your different tables that you can explore. Um, but I would say, as, as a user, um, like the current offerings out there in terms of how you hit your database tend to not be that great. Like people use like full Workbench or Deeper. It's another popular one, which I think is a very funny name. <laughs> They all feel very janky and old, old if you've ever used systems, whereas Snowflake is, you know, a very sleek, modern UI. I mean, you're not doing anything super, fan super fancy, right? You're just pull queries, getting back some tabular data. But as a user of Snowflake, like, like this web UI, I would say, is a huge, a huge differentiator and very nice to use compared to other things that I've done. You can do pretty much everything from here. You can you know, manage warehouses, so everything you know, you know can kind of be managed through the web, through the web UI or through SQL command. SQL command, because they also support you know they have a Python connector, they have any like a JDBC C connector. Do it with Snowflake. Yeah. So the one that you showed us, uh, how does that work with Excel? Because Excel is behind the schema right there, or so we'll get, yeah, we'll get to that later on. Um, yeah, yeah. So then, paper, they also talk about just like things that I kind of consider just like basic cloud stuff people like. So right, this is contrast probably to your on-prem data warehouse for the most part. And so they're in, they're in AWS, so they have availability zone, zones. Uh, so all of the Snowflake services, you know, are set up in such a way that if an availability becomes unavailable, it's going to keep on running, running. Standard, I would say, in the cloud world. Um, except for your, your warehouses, which are located in one AZ. But basically, they're just like, just like, yeah, if your warehouse fails, like, fine. It's just like a little bit of compute, like, spin one up in a new, new availability zone. It'll be okay. Because the data. Um, and then it's also designed to be upgraded. Again, it's SaaS product. It's like it's like pretty much the norm that your software is where it is created. Um, that is definitely not the norm in data data warehousing world, where where you know it's in your center, things like that. Uh -huh. 
So yeah, so yeah, so the JSON and ML support. Um, so yeah, I would say the main thing that this, so in data warehousing world, world, you talk a lot about ETL, which is extract, you're pulling the data from some data source, transform, doing some transformation on your data, and then loading. So like ETL was like, I think pretty big for everyone, but then like particularly big in Hadoop world, world right? pulling from one data source, data source, transforming it, and then loading it into your data warehouse. So with systems like Snowflake, uh, ELT, ELT started to be popular. Extracting raw data, in this case potentially in JSON or XML format, you're, you're loading it into your data warehouse, warehouse and then you're going to transform that data. Um, and so the way that Snow, Snowflake, I don't think I have anything about it in here. here. So basically, uh, Snowflake has some SQL extensions, so, so special uh, ways, ways to write queries support handling JSON and XML. So they have like special way, ways to access specific keys and stuff, and stuff like that, or tags, like tags, I guess, in XML. Um, and also the ways to like take nested data and flatten it, so to turn it and turn it into tabular data. And yeah, so this is really great for Snowflake because it encourages you to dump a lot of data, data direct to your warehouse, house, which is like, because that will add up eventually and you will be paying them for that. <laughs> and then also like, you're, you're, you're more locked in their system because like it's hard to get this kind of things working in other systems. There are also non-cynical benefits. There are also very non, so it's also great that you can, again, we talk about this like Hadoop Hadoop world and data warehouse world. Now it's like you can live totally, totally in data world. These jobs that previously you had to run in Hadoop. Like you can, you can, you can worry about Athena later instead, instead of having to like, right. like, it's, like it's stability there. And you know, for example, schemas are going to transform. It doesn't matter so much. You can, you can just dump it in there. And then, you know, and then, you know, as schemas, you can change your queries and figure that out. Yeah. So, you mean that it's not going to create tables, tables for it, it just remains in the Right, so by default, storage level. Yeah, yeah, when you dump it in. So at the, st at the storage level, so it actually does, some, does something cool, um, which I didn't really know about until I read this paper. So when you dump it in, kind of kind of at the most big level, it's, it's going to be a, I forget what they call it, a variant type column. That's their name for XML data. But what it does is, as it's loading this data for each object that it's stor storing onto disk, it's, it's looking at the and kind of looking at all right, what keys appear frequently in say this data in, in these JSON objects? What keys are, com are common, and are they like a day like that I know about? And can I kind of pre-process this, this and make it a column? Because maybe someone will want to will want to query this in the. So Snowflake is doing this pre-processing all the, all the time, um, and that, and that like later on, if you do wind up do wind up querying those, makes it much more efficient. So it's just a heuristic that they're applying, and adding adding col col columns in the database is very very cheap mm -hmm. as compared to adding columns in a in a row row storage format. Yeah. So well, well, that's how you do it. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it's cool because also, right, so it's not this optimization based on, you know, say you do your first initial load of a really big, big table, scanning thing, tens of thousands of records or millions, millions of records. And, all right, we've assessed this and like, these are the most common fields that here. It's for, for each individual file that's being, that's being sorted as it's doing this. So if your schema is changing over time for JSON data, it's like all of a sudden going to become become inefficient. Inefficient. You're going to have to like like re-index all the files or, or something like that. Snowflake is always going, always going to try to be smart. And it's not just not just a later benefit. It's also compression in the first place. So it's also storing the raw data still. Well, I mean, sure, sure, sure. But what I mean is like, hey, it's got a, a, some it's got a mm -hmm. Like it might do some kind of delta compression when it's storing that column or something. It saves space, space, so it can scan for later. But it also it also will save space. But I think it still has to store right the original big string. So like I'm not sure. I'm not saying it's destroying storing data. I'm saying it would be compressing it losslessly, more efficiently. Or but like that, like that was if you were only storing the column, right? Right. Right. It's storing the stuff that's outside the column. 
Yeah, okay, I guess maybe yeah. it's another and like, pointer to like, oh, we have, oh, we have this compressed data there. there. Would, would, would be, I would also compress yeah. when it yeah. thinks it's appropriate. If yeah. Implement it then. So it also, one that was cool, was cool that they didn't, where they do this, they do this operation of types is like if they identify a date time column, they're like, hey, I think this is, I think this is a date time. Like, I'm going to convert it, convert it, and store it. But then like, also I'm going to store the string just in case I'm wrong. This is, this is not a daytime. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That would be different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Not not saying that's the same. Drop dropping columns is even more efficient, more efficient than adding columns on the storage. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you said is quite tricky, right? Like this thing is X mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. complex structure, and then and then you have thousands of files, and something is very rare. It's 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 a very few files, mm -hmm. right? And you're not defined defined a schema. How do, you really, how do you really find it? How do you optimize that, right? So yeah, that one it's not, not going to like do any optimization oh, score proper problem. Yeah, so if you try and acquire it for that, for that, it's gonna have scan all the data. So like it has support, right, to let to let you query this data. And if you acquire common things, it hopefully is gonna be able to speed speed it up based on this optimization. But if you really work on this data frequently, most people are going to change it into a relational format. Yeah. Like that's, you're still probably going to do ELT, where you eventually transform the data. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to think if there's a way to avoid doing that schema mm -hmm. station. Because at, at times, a lot of work. Right? Definitely. Um, but I, again, again, like I think, People that are oper operating in this warehouse world, like they want the relational data because that's your, you know, your rep reporting layer on the warehouse. House. And on, you know, your right. Tableau or your, your Looker, or Power BI, BI or whatever. Um, we end up having to unnest a list or something, right? Even if they're related to what way, you don't actually just magically get the, the structure right. that you want. Or so yeah, it's not like, the easiest thing ever. So like writing these queries that deal with JSON data is like some trivia. <laughs> <laughs> not fun, but like you can do it in your warehouse is different than what, than what was possible. Cool. Um, so yeah, then as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, they have these extensions. Uh, if you have time travel, so any of these you can say, you know, Select from, from table at some stamp or at or I think before is where you specify like query or something like that like that specify query ID to see the database at, at different times. Um, in addition, they have all these cloning commands, so you so you can clone a table, a, a schema, a base, kind of at any la level, and it's super efficient because you just have to do have to do this. You know, metadata, data, pointer, two pointers to this S3 file, which you're, you're already storing. Um, like, yeah, the only cost is, cost is, you know, then you have the extra files potentially. Is this the first time this has been done? I mean, I mean, is this unique? I don't know that. Know that it's the first. I mean, I'm not sure. It's persistent data structure of metadata that is referring to a whole tree of you know, blocks or column fragments. I think. I, I don't know if the timeline is, but I know Cockroach DDB can do this, so might be before this. Yeah. And I'm thinking back when I was in school and what that was, you know, taking these classes and, and Right. Classes. Yeah, I don't, it's definitely not common. Whether or not they are the first ones to think, to think of it, or just... <coughs> RDBMSs are mostly about mutability, and then that's not what this is, this is about. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about Merge into. That's actually pretty an interesting operation which is my area where I'm interested. Merge, merge, I think it's also common, like, up, yeah, up, like up search. Or? Well, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of operations are much more efficient, right? So I guess it's raw and it's data and then you load it. There's still a lot of, like, like, Not like, like for example, trickling it's data. like, yeah, I don't want But drop, but drop and reload much, sure. right? So like most, of the, right? If you're doing this big merge, hopefully, hopefully it's still like a big merge 
on a lot of data. Yeah, you don't want to, you still don't want to run this on like a few records at a time. But like a big, a big update to kind of optimize for, optimize for, right? Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm just, that's just, that just strikes me as unusual. It's like a native object operation versus having to do a, bu do a bunch of smaller operations. One really common use case is when you're, you're trickling updates in from an operational system and you're using this thing, this for a reporting system, you want the reporting system to be near real time. Uh, so you're not waiting, waiting, so it's not up every couple hours or hours or, or, or over. And so if you've got a trickle of updates coming in, how do you how do you apply those? You can go and do individual individual select you know, insert updates. Um, and it's there's there's a sweet spot where ideally you don't want to if you can if you can avoid it, you don't want to be too zeet, but you might have to do fifty or hundred updates. And depending on your implementation, that that could that could be reasonably efficient, efficient or horrendously inefficient. Write the whole column, for example, that would be would be horrendously inefficient. Right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. We hear you. <laughs> Agreed. Unclear how they do they do it. Um, yeah, and they and they also have like these undrop commands, which is pretty cool. Because mm -hmm. everyone has done that at some point, you know. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's part of this. Part of this, it's like the other side of the clone. Yeah, yeah. With all these, you're just storing, you know, how long do you want to store these objects in your S3 bucket? And, you know, yeah, we'll let you, we'll let you retain it as long as you'll pay for it for that extra storage if you choose to. Yeah. All right. So Snowflake, its competitors at the time. Um, so right, you compare Snowflake versus Chip. So Redshift requires a lot of maintenance and tuning. So right, when you're writing data into a Redshift ta table, you have to think a fair amount, fair amount about like how is my data distri distributed across the various nodes. Like that, that's something you have to specify. You know, so as a sort, so there's so there's a distribution and a sort key. key. And then my data be sorted on disk. And like you tend to think about this, tend to think about all right, all right, which columns am I frequently frequently joining on? Well, I want that data to be distributed to the same places so that we don't have to be, be distributing data over the network. Uh, there's also like, in Redshift, you have to vacuum your databases, like that's the command vacuum. And that's like do, doing the, sort, the sorting and stuff like that, that is kind of, your data has gotten messy over time. Blocks have been marked as dead, but they, they stick around for a while. Um, compared to Redshift, it's actually faster to scale up and down compute because you know you just have separated warehouse houses and you don't worry about the data data shift it's tied together so if you know you're scaling up like it has to scale up and then it has to re redistribute the data into these into these new nodes it takes time um, yeah the compute and storage are separated you can <coughs> you know you get to the point where you're like well my compute is fine but I'm running out of storage so I need to scale up my cluster um, and yeah, at the at the time, it had JSON support, support really big. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, with big BigQuery, right, like it was actually actually SQL. Like, BigQuery has some like SQL like SQL language that, that was just uh, different. So so it didn't necessarily play with all your systems systems uh, that you wanted it, you wanted it to. And at the time, you couldn't update or delete in BigQuery. So like it was pretty. You also couldn't also couldn't join until a few years ago. So yeah, maybe you couldn't even join at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's just way scan really big big tables really fast. Now it's much better. <laughs> yeah, my understanding of BigQuery was it was initially like a SQL SQL adapter on top of the SQL database. It wasn't really like a new database so much. They were oh, oh, you can, SQL can use SQL. SQL. <laughs> oh, and it's flavor. <laughs> yeah. All right. So today, um, the change. So in the in the Redshift world, you know the you know the major thing that's different is they have Redshift Spectrum. So it's, the way Spectrum works is is that you have your data in, in S3 bucket. Um, it's different in the sense that like you are actually putting the objects into your S3 bucket. You know exactly exactly what the format are. You know you have to split them up and things like that. Um, but yeah, so you have, so you have your data in S3. And then you just you just have this like full compute that comes with, that comes with data. So it's similar to the BigQuery model. You pay for how much it needs to scan, 
and you know it's gonna it's gonna scale up and down on its own. Um, but comparing it to Snowflake, so you you do you have to manually manage these, fi these files. You have to define what the define what the schema is of your files, which can be difficult. Um, you can't just just use Spectrum on its own. So if you want to be Redshift Spectrum, you still need a Redshift cluster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like the most frequent point in the Redshift world, normal world, normally you have which is like for the data that's hot, that's being frequently queried. And then like you you want you have data if someone if someone needs to query, you want them to be be able to just write their SQL query and get it. But like visibly to them, it them it's actually an SD, which is which is cheaper to just store it there and. It's like an annex to a regular Redshift cluster. cluster. Correct. Um, yeah, so you don't have uh, control over the compute capacity, whereas in Snowflake you have like these t-shirt sizes. And yeah, here's the data scan. scan. Uh, so BigQuery world, my understanding, it's it's really good now. <laughs> so Big, BigQuery compared to Snowflake is like even less tuning. In BigQuery, you don't you don't even have this t-shirt size for size for compute. Like it's just gonna there's, scale there's no up. No servers, there's no CPUs, there's there's no storage. Right. Nothing. It's magical. magical. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so you can pay per query or for dedicated sources. That's big actually reports like this like this query costs this much. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't think Redshift does a spectrum. Like you get you get bills, you know, at the end of the month or whatever. <laughs> Data engineering teams are actually writing like tests that run run on their like, you know the, the the tables that are supporting to test the queries that the reports run to make make sure that the data the expect, expected data usage are not like they're that they're essentially that's like the end of the pipeline. Yeah. Um, cool. And that's it. So like the world the world is I would say summarize like. like a lot of these things that were the huge snowflake, snowflake differentiator time are now kind of, kind of global across all the products. Again, I know nothing about Azure Data Warehouse, but I, but I imagine it's also fine, fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think at the time that Snowflake came out, it's very innovative, and I think to this day, day it's like a very strong SaaS product. You know, as a SaaS product, they can continue to, to tune under the hood as much as much as they want to, ways that some of these things, or I guess mostly Redshift, cannot do, because people are optimizing around the way the system currently works. Uh, and, and I'm a big fan, even though I am no longer a user. <laughs> thank, thank you.